A woman wrote me a message. She has children struggling terribly emotionally and struggling with Yiddishkeit. And if she mentions Torah, she alienates them. So she has to fill her house with things that will allow her children to stay in the house and stay close to her. And she says, my Shabbos table does not have Divrei Torah. And I sit at Shiurim before Shavuos and I say, this doesn't relate to me. So now I'm talking to you. Hope you're listening. Comes Rabbi Akiva and says, there's a deeper relationship with Torah. Torah doesn't always look the same way for all people. If this is the shlichus that Hashem put you on, him, say hineni. Hein comes from the word hineni. Hineni, hein, yes. I'm here, I'm not running away, I'm not disassociating, I'm not even getting upset at you. The yeshiva.net. So today's class is dedicated by Harav Reb David and Chaya Rivka Feldman in loving memory of her father and his father-in-law, Rabbi Shmuel Isaac, Ben, Harav Avram, Halevi Popek, Zechreinam Levrach, and tribute to Rabbi Shmuel Isaac's yard site, 11th yard site, on the fifth day of Sivan, Erev Shavuos, Tehei Neshmas Eitzruda, Betzrei Rachaim, he be an eternal source of light and blessing and inspiration to his children and the entire family, Betzrei Klal Yisrael, and to all of you with a lot of bracha and atzlacha, thank you very, very much. Today, we're going to explore what would seem like a very, very technical argument with really little practical relevance and even conceptual relevance, it would seem. Almost about a tiny detail it would even be difficult to understand why we would argue about that, but Jews, of course, know how to argue about everything. And yet, upon deeper reflection, it really opens up vistas to very profound and extremely relevant and life-changing ideas. Let's begin. Since Shavuos is coming, on Shavuos we read the Aseris Adibris. The reading of the Torah on the first day of Shavuos is the Aseris Adibris, the Ten Commandments, Parshas Yisrael. And the Medrash actually says something fascinating, and that is that Hashem told the Jewish people, as you read the story of Matan Torah, of Sinai, every single year on Shavuos, it's like a re-experience, a reenactment of that very experience the first time. It says the first time by Matan Torah, the Medrash says that if Hashem said if even one Jew was missing, a child, an infant, a woman, a man, he would have not been able to give the Torah, because everyone is an indispensable component in the cosmic symphony. So it's a fascinating image. It says, echad. Even if one person was missing, you would think a little baby, or what's, what's the relevance of it? But somehow, everything is missing. The whole, the picture is not there. It can't happen. And therefore, by Matan Teda, every single person had to be there. As it says in Medrash, and Pekka de even the souls of the Geirim, the people who would later convert, their souls were also there. Not just the souls of all the Jewish people, but even those who at that time were not Jewish, and even later they would only become Jewish, they were also there. And uh, so the Medrash says, and each year Hashem says, you can re- we're going to reenact the very experience. So when the reading on the first day of Shavuos, after Shachras, when they read the Torah, we read Parshish Yisrael, and we read the story. And that's why <laughs> there's a minig by many, and I remember growing up, the Lubavitch Rebbe used to always urge everyone to come, hear the Aseris Sadibris, come to Shul to hear the Aseris Sadibris, the first day of Shavuos, even babies and infants, men and women, because of the power that it says in Medrash that this is literally the re-experience of Matan Torah. So therefore, every Jew deserves and belongs to be there. So on this, on the first Pasuk of Matan Torah, there is a fascinating and very perplexing and seemingly enigmatic argument. How does the whole story of Matan Torah begin, the giving of the Torah at Sinai? It begins with the Pasuk. This is Parshas Yisra, Perik Chav, Pasuk Aleph, Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. Vayidaber elekim eskol hadvarim ma'ela leimer. Hashem spoke all these words to say. And then he begins, Anoichi Hashem alekecha. The first saying is, I am Hashem your God. By the way, it's interesting. We translate it as the Ten Commandments, but it's not really the Hebrew name for it. Aseris Hadibris, right? We call it, if we call Aseris HaMitzvah or Aseris HaTzivuyim, it's Ten Commandments. Really, Aseris Hadibris, Dibris are not commandments. Dibris is a conversation. Dibur. 
It's just a very, very <laughs> interesting to point out. Because a commandment could sometimes feel like it's aloof, it's, it's distant. People don't like being commanded things. Yeah, I know I don't. Somebody says, I command you. <laughs> huh? A lot of our translations are based on other cultures that translated the Bible into Hebrew and they gave it names and the name stuck, like the tree of knowledge being an apple. Yeah, Apple makes phones, not trees. <laughs> The phones could be as bad as the Eitz Hadas, no question. But uh, maybe that's the source. Somehow knew that what Apple is going to produce is going to confuse a lot, a lot of people. Could be. But uh, it's not so simple. I'm saying a lot of things. Moshe had horns, you know, Karan Arpne Moshe. Moshe had horns, etc. Not all translations are completely accurate. And then he begins the ten sayings. The Ten Connections, Anoichi Hashem is the first one, I am God, you God who took you out of Egypt. And then the second one, you shouldn't have any other gods, etc., etc., all the way till the tenth. Chazal, our sages, always attentive to nuance, right away felt the difficulty in the first Pasuk. And the difficulty is the word lamer. Lamer is a very common word in Chumash. It constantly says, Vayedabra Hashem el Moshe, lamer. Why does it say Lamer? Hashem is talking to Moshe not for himself. It's not just a conversation with Moshe. It's Lamer to be said. Right? In Yiddish, the teachers always translate Azoitzuzagen. Yeah? <laughs> I don't know if it's an accurate translation, but that's what many of us grew up with. Lamer, Azoitzuzagen. You're not pointing? Out. You're not pointing? Out. Okay. Lamer, Azoitzuzagen. What does it mean, Azoitzuzagen? Azoit Zogen means tzu iber zogen, really, Azoit tzu iber zogen. He's speaking to Moshe to share it, lamer, it should be said to others. That is, that is sensible when it comes to every other mitzvah in Chumash, where Hashem speaks to Moshe, and Moshe is the teacher who's going to transmit it to the Jewish people. But that would not apply to this Pasuk, because here... He's not saying it to Moshe to say it over to the people. It's fact that Moshe is not even mentioned here. The whole point of the event at Sinai was all the people were present. Directly they heard it. In fact, as the Rambam points out, and many other great Jewish philosophers like Yehuda Alevi and others, that the great uniqueness of Judaism over every other faith in the history of humanity is every single other faith is about a few, an individual, or at most a few people who experienced a divine revelation. And then they transmitted it to many people who accepted it, who believed it, and embraced it and internalized it. And you're talking about literally, we know about today uh, 12,000 religions. <laughs> most people can only name a few, but there are around 12,000 religions throughout history, there were many more. And all of them begin with a story of one person who had a vision, who heard a voice, who experienced God, whether it's in Christianity, Yashka, Isiyayish, whether it's in Islam, Muhammad, whether it's in Utah, the Mormons, Joseph Smith, or the Buddha, whatever it may be, thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago, one person who then taught it and said, this is what I saw, and a person with a lot of charisma or wisdom or some power can influence lots of people. By definition, you could never know if it's completely authentic. Or somebody just had an imagination, somebody made it up, somebody fabricated it, and so forth. The uniqueness of Matan Torah is that as the Chumash claims, every single Jew experienced it. Not Moshe Rabbeinu, every single Jew. If I come to you, all of you, and I say, last night I had a dream that God told me that all of you should give me all your money. Okay? Or at least half of your money, 50%. It didn't happen, but... Uh, <laughs> now, you could choose to believe me. You could say, I'm a charlatan, I'm a, I'm a thief, I'm weird, I'm a sugar, I'm insane. Maybe if I have enough of charisma and gift of gab, maybe you'll choose to believe me. But you could say, he's lying, he's not lying. Maybe he had the imagination, maybe he's going through something, who knows? I have somebody good to see, maybe he needs some vitamin D, vitamin B, vitamin C, some zinc, whatever. But... Uh, what if I tell you all that last night you had a dream? Everyone here had a dream, X, Y, Z. Now you know for sure 
that I'm lying because <laughs> I'm talking about you. Chumash, the only religion that makes that claim, not Moshe saw, you saw was the Jewish people. It's interesting. Why did no other religion make such a claim that millions of people were there and saw it? It's a very nice story. It's a beautiful story. The answer is, to make such a claim, it has to happen. <laughs> because if I'm telling three billion people you were there, they right away know I'm a charlatan, I'm a liar, I'm a thug. I once saw there was one, there was a branch of Hinduism that also claims a similar idea, that there were a million people at the Revelation, but then they add one more clause, and that is they all died afterwards besides one person. <laughs> so you're back to square one where everybody died besides one person. And it's a fascinating thing because if somebody wrote the Chumash, if somebody fabricated the Chumash, let's call him uh, uh, George, uh, let's call him Moshe Jefferson or Moshe Washington, whoever this uh, Moshe was who fabricated a very interesting document with a story that it never happened, and he comes to the people and he sells it, what's the first question I'm going to ask him? First I'm going to ask him is it says that there were three million Jews here who were commanded to tell this to their children and promised that it would never cease and it would never stop. So where, where are all these people? Oh, uh, <laughs> why would you write something that right away shows that you're a liar? Just say it's all me. Nobody ever saw it. Nobody ever knew it. It's a much easier way to sell a story. So this, this aspect of Matan Torah is not just a little detail. It's essential. It's essential to the entire understanding of Judaism, it's clear, it's clear what I'm saying. It's a very, very interesting concept because you have no other religion in history that ever made such a claim. And we, we can understand why. I don't blame them. <laughs> it doesn't make sense to make such a claim. To make such a claim, you're taking a very, very, very big risk. It's, I'm writing a book and writing something that's really proving that I'm alive. There's a lot of things in Torah like that. If a person is writing it, you want to make sure that it's going to be as believable as possible in the sense of not making promises that you and I know you're not going to be able to deliver. For example, there's a promise there that if Jews keep Shemitah, there's going to be an extra blessing on the sixth year that will provide enough grain for year six, for year seven, for year eight, and sometimes for year nine. Unless you're in charge on the weather and on global warming and on climate change, unless you're really in charge, you don't make such promises. I'm not going to tell you that if you do what I want, Right? I'm going to give you enough grain. How do I know? <laughs> what if it's not raining? I mean, these, are, these are things you got to be very, very careful to say. A person, what, somebody promises Avram Avinu, right? You, you're just a little guy. You don't even have a child. He's 75 years old. He's infertile. His, his wife is infertile. They never had a child. They can't have a child. And you're saying, oh, by the way, a great nation is going to come from you and all the people on earth are going to be blessed by you. Really? This is like a promise? Of course, you look three and a half, uh, four thousand years later, and more than a third of humanity considers itself spiritual ears of Avram Avinu, besides all of the biological ears of Avram Avinu. Or a promise like in Parshas Bechukaisa, you'll be scattered all over the world, but you're never going to be eradicated. Like, thousands of years ago, you're going to say that? The Roman Empire is gone, the Egyptian Empire is gone, the Assyrian Empire is gone, the Babylonian Empire is gone, the Byzantine Empire is gone, the Greek Empire is gone. They were much larger and bigger than the Jewish people. They're all gone. They're all in Wikipedia. Thousands of years ago, to promise a little nation that will never be obliterated, you got to be crazy because you're proving that you're just making up things. So these are different things you see in the Torah that if I was writing it, or Moshe Jefferson was writing it, or again, Avram Washington was writing it, or whatever the name is, right? Miriam Adam, I mean, okay, now I actually used, use a real name. But, uh, okay, <laughs> let's do Miriam Washington was writing it. I would uh, be very, very careful to at least make it plausible. So if all the Jewish people were there, certainly of that generation, in a physical level, besides themselves, what's the lamer? Vaidabra l'kim is kol advarim ha'ela lamer, the word lamer, ain't lay havana, doesn't have an understand. Uh huh? <laughs> Oh, so that's the question. So you could say, tell it to your children. But according to the Medrash, Pirkei Rebbe Lezer, that all the Neshamas were there, and even the Neshamas Hagerim, right? So that would be the question of Lem. So Chazal picked up on this. And the truth is, throughout the generations, there's different interpretations. In the Medrash, one of the most authoritative and earliest texts of the oral tradition is called the Mechilta. The Mechilta was authored by Rabbi Yishmael. It was authored by Rabbi Yishmael. And uh, this is one of the earliest, earliest texts. And in the Mechilta, this question is addressed. And the Tanoim, the sages, interpreted it in a very original way. Lamer is not to be repeated to others, but actually to give feedback. 
God was asking for feedback. Lamer, I want to hear what you have to say. This is not a monologue, it's a dialogue. A monologue means I talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and nobody says anything. Some people like it that way. I want you to say something. Like, tell me if you like what I'm saying. Tell me if you don't like what I'm saying. I want to hear, as we call it, feedback. I want a response. That's the lamer. Now the question is, what was the... So the Jews gave a response. What was the nature of the response? So the Torah doesn't say it explicitly. It's all intimated in the word lamer. What the response was on this, of course, there's an argument. That we responded, there's no argument, labor. You got to say something. What we said, oh, this is not so simple. And who argues about this? Two of the greatest sages in Jewish history, two of some of the great, two of the greatest sages in Jewish history, two of the greatest Tanoim, Rabbi Yishmael and Rabbi Akiva. You'll see in your second source, Mechilta, Lamer, Melamed, this teaches us. Shayu Oimrim al Hain Hain, via Lav Lav, Divrei Rabbi Yishmael. The words here are very succinct and accurate. Rabbi Shmuel says, this teaches us. The Jewish people said, al hain on yes, they said yes. Va'alav, and no, on no, lav, they said no. Meaning, the ten aseris adibris, the ten sayings, include positive instructions and negative ones. For example, you should remember the day of Shabbos to sanctify it. Number four, Zohar Yusema Shabbos, that's a positive thing. Number five, respect your father and mother. is a positive thing. The first one, I am the God, your God, who has taken you out of Egypt. That's a positive thing. But then there's also negative injunctions. For example, don't murder her. Don't don't, uh, be an injunction against adultery. Right? Don't testify falsely. Don't covet other people's, other people's lives, other people's properties, other people's possessions. Um, don't make an image of God. Don't have other gods. Number three, don't swear God's name in vain. So Rabbi Shmuel says the feedback varied. al on things that Hashem was saying to do, to engage in, what did they say? They said, yeah. Well, of course. And Hashem said, He wanted feedback. So they said, of course, we're in. We love Shabbos. When Hashem said, Lois Sertzach, don't murder, they said, of course not. Love, not, never. Never are we going to murder or steal or kidnap or lo- etc. That's Rabbi Shmuel. So the feedback varied. Al Heinein va Lav Lav. Comes Rabbi Akiva and says, no. Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva says, Al Heinein vi Al Lav Hein. On the positive things, they said, yeah. And on the negative things, they also said, yeah. Meaning, when Hashem said, respect your father and mother, they said, of course. And when he said, don't murder, they said, of course. Excellent question. Aren't they saying exactly the same thing? What's the difference if I tell my child? Never cross the street without Tati holding your hand. Do you understand? And he says, yes. Or never cross the street. And he says, of course I won't cross the street without holding your hand. It's the same thing. Both are saying they agreed. It's not like Rabbi Akiva says, God said, don't steal. They said, yeah, we will steal. <laughs> That's not what he means. <laughs> exactly. That's the question. It seems like the argument is completely about semantics. What's the difference if you tell me I'm going to do what you say I'm going to do? I'm going to do what you ask me to do. Yes. Right? If you ask your husband and I, please don't lock the door because somebody is coming in later. What do they say? I'm not going to lock the door. Or yes, of course. You're saying the same thing. But they're arguing about it. And who's arguing about it? Rabbi Shmuel and Rabbi Akiva. So again, at first glance, if somebody doesn't read into it, it looks like you, we just really have to argue about anything you can argue about, turn it into an argument. Their mom is saying the same thing. It's simply a question of expression, of semantics, with absolutely, apparently, no substantial di- difference or differentiation between Bishmo and Rabbi Akiva. That's number one. Number two, 
Why did these two people argue about it? What's the connection to Rabbi Shmuel and Rabbi Akiva? And Rabbi Shmuel said this position. Rabbi Akiva said the other position. Number three. This is an interesting question. You have to think about this for a moment. But in Torah, everything is very precise, including the words of the Tanayim. They did not repeat themselves if it was unnecessary. Meaning, an expression is meticulous, it's precise, it's not superfluous, it's not excessive. Every word has within it meaning. When Rabbi Akiva gives his opinion, he's arguing with Rabbi Shmuel. But about what part is he arguing? Only about one piece. He agrees with Rabbi Shmuel that on the positive things they said yes. Right? al hain hain they both agree. What's his argument with Rabbi Shmuel? Only on the negative ones. So why did Rabbi Akiva repeat al hain hain That he agrees with Rabbi Shmuel. He should have just said, Allah hain In other words, the first part there's no argument about. So Rabbi Akiva's repeating that seems unnecessary. It says, Rabbi Shmuel Lomer al hain hain ba'alav lav. So what should Rabbi Akiva say? Alav osa hain. Right? Gam alav hain ba'alav. Because on the hain hain, he's not disagreeing with Rabbi Shmuel. He's repeating what he said. So you say, what's the difference? He's just repeating his entire position. But if that's not the argument, so it's obvious Rabbi Akiva holds like Rabbi Shmuel in this area. Why does he have to repeat the al hain hain? Al hain hain v'alav hain. When on the Hain, they absolutely agree. So that's not Rabbi Akiva's contribution. The truth is that this argument between them is a very profound argument. Not only is it not about semantics, it's an argument that takes us into very deep reflection about many experiences in life, and not just many experiences in life, but probably the totality of how one experiences life. In order to understand this, we're going to discuss and go through a few stories about Rabbi Akiva. These are a selection of many, there's so many stories and insights and teachings of Rabbi Akiva that are scattered throughout Mishnayis and Gemara and Midrashim. Literally so much because of Rabbi Akiva's unique status and position. Remember Rabbi Akiva was a person who didn't learn until 40 years old. Rabbi Akiva was a child of converts. So he came from non-Jews. His grandfather and grandmother were not Jewish. Even as being a Jew, he was completely illiterate till the age of 40. He was a shepherd, a very nice and simple shepherd, to the point that his future father-in-law, Kalba Savua, when he heard that his daughter suggested to Rabbi Akiva to get married, to get to marry, that they should marry each other, he completely banned her and excommunicated her and his son-in-law from wealth, from his wealth, because he was one of the wealthiest Jews. So they became completely alienated from him, and they lived in horrific poverty for many years. Rachel, who sacrificed this for Rabbi Akiva, sent him to learn for 12 years, and then another 12 years, he comes back with 24,000 students. And he tells them famously, the Gemara says in Ksuvas, page 62, Shaliva Shalachem Shalahu, it's all hers. And then the 24,000 students ultimately perish in a famous pandemic, which is one of the reasons for the mourning during the Sphira time. And Rabbi Akiva goes to the south and he starts over again with five students. <clears throat> Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon ben Yechai, Rabbi Nechemia. And he literally f- begins with these five and they're the ones who transmit the whole oral tradition from Rabbi Akiva. And that's what the Gemara says in Sanhedrin, page 86, Kulu Aliba de Rabbi Akiva. The whole tradition that we have comes from Rabbi Akiva. So Rabbi Akiva occupies a tremendous place, one of the greatest places in the whole history of Torah and of Jewish history. Ultimately, his end would be tragic. He would be killed by the Romans. Rabbi Akiva supported the Bar Kaichva revolt, which broke out 60 years after the destruction of the second Beis Hamikdash. The second Beis Hamikdash was destroyed in the year 70 after the Common Era. And the Bar Kaichva staged a revolt against the Roman Empire in the year 162 or 163. I'm sorry, 132 after the Common Era. So that's literally 60 years, 62 years after the Chorban. Rabbi Akiva supported him, supported him tremendously, even saying that he is Mashiach. He felt that Bar Kaichva has all the signs of being Mashiach who will liberate the Jews from the Romans. And it made sense. The first Gullus was for 60 years. The second one is also for, the first one was 70 years. And the second one is 60 years and change. 
Unfortunately, Bar Kaicha was killed, the revolt was crushed, even though it was extremely successful for a few years, he began building the third base HaMikdash Bar Kaichva. And he minted coins, and he uh, regained independence of Yerushalayim for a long time. And uh, I think two legions of the Roman troops were eradicated, which was unheard of in the Roman Empire. It was extremely, extremely successful, but then the revolt was crushed. Rabbi Akiva was also murdered by the Romans. So there's a few stories I want to point out from Rabbi Akiva as we delve into this argument, seemingly such a simple argument, and yet an extremely profound one upon deeper reflection. So if you'll take a look down the page, Makkah is Chavdal Ramad Beis, it's a few paragraphs down. This is a famous story in Talmud Makkah's page 24. Shuv pa'am achas hoi oil ni Yerushalayim, kivin shigiyu la ratzoifim karu bigdeyem, kivin shigiyu la harabai yisro shul sheyotzom beis kotshe akadoshim, his chilu hein boichin rebe akivim etzachik. The great sages of the time went up to Yerushalayim and they came to Mount Scopus, haratzoifim. They all rent their garments and the reason is because from this mountain they could see, they have a vision of the harabai of the Temple Mount and they see the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. So they all rent, they all tear their garments. They come to the Harabayas, they continue their journey and they come to actual Temple Mount and they see a fox coming out from the place where the Holy of Holies once stood. Now remember, these are people who lived through, they were there at the end of the second Beis HaMikdash. So this wasn't just a story that they read about or heard about from Azeda. Some of them were actually there or were there right after. So it was very, very um, tangible. The loss was extremely, it was immediate, it was tangible, it was very concrete was right there in front of their eyes. It wasn't just nostalgia based on what you heard from previous generations. So when they see a fox coming out of the place that they knew this was where the Kaddish HaKadoshim actually stood, they all start crying. It overtakes them. And Rabbi Akiva starts laughing. Why are you laughing? Like a Jew, you answer a question with another question. You don't just answer a question. So when they say, why are you laughing? He says, well, why are you crying? So they say, they explain, they knew why they're crying. They say, this is a place that the Torah says, Hazar HaKariv Yumas, even a Zar, a Yisrael, or a Levi, or a Kayan, outside of the Kayan Gadol who goes in here in the wrong time, or if you're not a Kayan Gadol ever, you must. The energy is too intense, a person can't survive. And now foxes are running around in this place. We shouldn't weep. You're asking us why we're crying. That's the most natural thing to do to be able to see such destruction, to be able to recognize and observe the contrast, the radical, the, the overwhelming feeling is one you can't escape. You know, from the highest of the highs to the lowest of the lows, we you see what the abyss looks like. So they're crying. <laughs> so he says, I don't know this. That's why I'm laughing. What's the lekachani mitzachik? That's a reason to laugh. That now the foxes are roaming in the base Kaddish HaKadoshim. So Rabbi Akiva knows that he has to explain himself. So he goes on a long explanation. And the point of his explanation is that Yeshaya says, God says, I have two loyal witnesses. There was a prophet named Uriah, Uriah HaKayin, and there was another prophet named Scharia, Uriah and Scharia. Why does Hashem call them two witnesses? What's the connection? Uriah and Shaya lived in different generations. Uriah was a prophet in the first Beis HaMektosh. Shaya was a prophet in the beginning of the second Beis HaMektosh, part of the team, Chagai, Shaya, Malachi, Mordechai, the beginning of the Anshei Knesset Sagdel. It's a whole different generation. Why are you making them two witnesses? Two witnesses work together. So Rabbi Akiva explains that there's a profound meaning here. Why? Because Uriah gave a prophecy, and it's in the book of Micha, the book of Micah, Micha chapter 3, Tziyon Sada Techarish. Zion will be plowed like a field. In other words, the great Sia and the great Yerushalayim and the Beis HaMikdash, you see, it's going to be plowed by a, a field. That's the prophecy of Uriah. Scharia gave a different prophecy. In the book of Scharia, he says, Oid Yeshvu, skenim uskenis b'ruchavis Yerushalayim. One day the elders, males and females, skenim and skenis, will stroll and celebrate in the streets of Yerushalayim. So Rabbi Akiva says, Yeshaya says, these are two witnesses. Two witnesses depend on each other. So he says, as long as the prophecy of Uriah was not fulfilled, I was afraid that the prophecy of Zechariah won't be fulfilled. 
But now that I see the prophecy of Uriah fulfilled, because where do foxes hang out? They hang out in forests and in jungles and in open fields, right? Sometimes you can even see a fox in Muncie in certain places, especially a few years ago before all the houses came up. Now that I see that foxes come out here, in other words, it was plowed like a field. Now I know that the second prophecy will be fulfilled too. Take a look, the last two lines of this source. He says it beautifully, Rabbi Kiva's words. Now that the first prophecy was fulfilled, it's known that the second one will be fulfilled. And the Gemara concludes in very moving words, This is the language that they said to Rabbi Akiva. Akiva nechamtanu, Akiva nechamtanu. Akiva, you have comforted us. Akiva, you have comforted us. That's what the sages replied to Rabbi Akiva when he explained this to them. Why he was quelling, why he was metzachik, why he was laughing when he saw the foxes come out. Now here's the obvious question. The other Tanayim didn't believe in the prophecy that one day Yerushalayim will be rebuilt. It's one of the fundamentals of Jewish faith. We say, Ani mamin shleima, Rabbi Akiva is not the only one who believed. And even Rabbi Akiva himself, if he wouldn't have seen the tzia and plowed into a, like a field, he didn't believe that the Nevi'im were right. Obviously he did. And the other, the other Tanayim also believed it. What is it that created the distinction between Rabbi Akiva and the other Tanayim that they cried and he laughed? Let's go to the next story. The next story is Brachas Dav Samach. These are famous stories, but here you have the sources. It's an, it's an Aramaic. Rabbi Akiva have a ka'azel ba'urcha. Rabbi Akiva was traveling. Matala he must, he came to a city. Bo Ushpizi was looking for a hotel. Ushpizi was looking for a host. Ushpizin, he wanted to be a guest. He was looking for a house to take him in. A motel six, a bed and breakfast, a psashtip, somebody to take him in. Layavile, nobody would give him a place to sleep. That's pretty frustrating, right? You come to a place and you're looking for a little achnasas archim. Nobody would give him a place. Amar, so what does he say? Called the Avid Rahman Latav. Whatever God does is for the good. It must be good for me not to have a place in the city. So what does he do? He goes into he goes into the field, he goes into the forest, and that's where he camps out at night. What, what do you do? You go out and you find a place to camp out. He had, as we know, a chicken, a rooster. He had a donkey and he had a candle. So what happens? Asazika, the wind comes and extinguishes the flame. It wasn't easy to light a candle. He didn't just have matches and he could relight it. And even if he had a way, the wind was just blowing it out. Then a cat came and killed the rooster. Achal Tarnagayla killed the rooster. It reminds you of Chadgadia, right? A cat came and again made saris. Not to the goat, now to the, now, not to the goat. Chadgadia, this time it was a, it was a rooster. No, you still have a donkey. Asa Arye. This was, was well, apparently it was a real forest and there was real wildlife. It wasn't just a little fake forest in the Catskills where you build a fire. And uh, this was a real forest. Asa Arye, a lion came and took the donkey. Achla Lecham ate the donkey. Omar, Rabbi Akiva says, Kol David Rachman al-Latav. He repeats his mantra, whatever Hashem does is for the good. That night, the Gemara says, Asa Gaisa Shavi Lamas. An army came in from the enemy and abducted the people living in the city. So Rabbi Akiva turned to his students, he was with an entourage of students, and he says, the last line, You see, we were all saved. Because we didn't have a place to sleep in the city, nobody gave us a place, we were saved. Of course, if there would have been a candle burning, they would have known, they would have recognized that people are here. If the rooster would have made noise, or the donkey would have made noise again, we would have been found, so this is all good, we were saved. This is the second story. And then there's a third story, and this is the story of Rabbi Akiva's last moments. This is also in Masechus Brachas Samach Aleph. And this is the story that the Roman Empire made a decree that nobody should learn Torah. They wanted to completely uproot every last vestige of Judaism. A man named Papus Ben Yehud, this saw Rabbi Akiva was not just teaching, he was gathering large communities, large masses of people and teaching. And ultimately... <clears throat> they caught Rabbi Akiva and they imprisoned him. And then the Gemara describes, <laughs> They took out Rabbi Akiva to his, Rabbi Akiva to his death. It was a time of Kriyashma, which means it was early in the morning. Because the time of Kriyashma is before sunrise. So this was very early in the morning. 
The Romans were torturing him. They were combing his flesh with iron combs. He was accepting the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. The students were there. The Romans turned this into a spectacle. They did it in Caesarea. According to Seder Adairis, this was on Yom Kippur, a day before Yom Kippur. Amrulay Talmidov, his Talmidim said, Rabbeinu, our Rebbe, at Khan. How much, how much can you do, uh, how long can you do this for? Meaning, Rabbi Akiva, as he's experiencing this, he's saying Shema, and the Talmidim couldn't understand this. At Khan, like, At Khan means like, is there a limit to your, to your faith? Like, At Khan, you know? <laughs> how, can you, how can you say Shema Yisrael now? This was their question. This is what they're asking Rabbi Akiva at these moments. Omar Lahem, what does he say to them? Imagine that he has the presence of mind to respond to them. And he doesn't just tell them one word, he tells them something. He remains a teacher till the last moment. My whole life, I was pained by the verse, you should love God with all your soul. Which means even if you have to give up your soul. And I always said, when will I be able to fulfill this mitzvah? Now that I have an opportunity, you, don't, you want me not to fulfill this moment? This is something I aspired for, to be able to give up my soul. And now that I have the opportunity, you just want me to let it go? He prolonged the echad, Hashem echad, and his soul left his body by the word echad. A voice from heaven came out and said, Fortunate are you, Rabbi Akiva, or how great are you, Rabbi Akiva, that your soul, your soul exited the physical world, the physical embodiment by Echad. These are three stories about Rabbi Akiva. The first one, him laughing when the fox comes out. The second one is when he's thrown out of a city and then he loses all of his possessions, the candle, the donkey, the rooster. Again, he remains completely positive. And the third one, in the most painful moment of his life, he's saying, Shema, he explains to his student, his students, that Kol Yomai, my whole life I thought, Masa Yeah. Yeah. According to Chazal, he was, a very, he was very old, he was 120. Which means he lived a very long, very long and extremely productive Life, but the Talmudim couldn't understand how he's responding this way, so he said what he said. Well, these stories give us a little insight to begin to dissect the argument between Rabbi Shmuel and Rabbi Akiva, how the Jews responded to Matan Taira. Rabbi Shmuel says they said yes on some things and no on other things. Rabbi Akiva said they said yes on everything. It's not a, if it was an issue of semantics, they wouldn't argue. It's not like they didn't have what to do. They said, let's argue about something else. Because there's really another question here. We have an expression in Chazal, what was, was. To argue about something that happened thousands of years ago with no relevance today is futile. It's just an argument, just to sake of argument. This is something that happened thousands of years ago. If you're arguing about how many candles you have to light the first night of Hanukkah, like Basilim, I understand. You're arguing about when is the time of Kriya Shema in the morning, I understand. You're arguing about how many tzitzis to have. I understand. You're arguing which bracha. You're arguing about something that happened 3,335 years ago. That's exact. That's not repeated again. What's the point? So you have to say that they're not arguing about a fact that happened that's irrelevant. They're arguing about a theme, a message. The reason they're arguing about this is because it represents two different hashkafas, two different perspectives. Rabbi Akiva says on the positive they said yes, on the negative they said no. Rabbi Akiva says on everything they said yes. Because this is really a question of how the Jewish people accepted and internalized the Aseris Adibris. The ten sayings, which would become a paradigm and an archetype for all of the 630 mitzvahs. Rabbi Shmuel said their experience of it was a personal one and a subjective one in terms of how I, how they appreciated and understood the value of a mitzvah. So when Hashem says, Zachir is Yom HaShabbos Lakachi, you should remember Shabbos. It's not just, they said, yeah, we're going to do it. The yes was an internal yes. We appreciate it, we celebrate it, we get it. <laughs> of course, yes, 
It was an enthusiastic, resounding yes. It wasn't just yes, I'll do it. It was a yes that came from the very uh, core of their being. Their, every fiber of their being screamed out, yes. It was something that their body and their soul and their mind and their nervous system, every sinew, every cell in their body said, yes. This is the right thing. It's like when your body exclaims, yes, this is good. That's the yes. When they heard, Lois Sertzach, don't murder, every fiber of their being exclaimed, no. They can feel the repulsion of it, the, the toxicity of it, the venom, the evil, the negativity. Of course, I run away from this. Like it says in Perkeyavis, you know, have a ratzla mitzvah berech menavera. In our life, when somebody is, is, is in touch with their truest needs, so there's something that's positive, you run to it. I embrace it. There's something that's negative, I, I sense it, I feel it. What do I do? Fed, this is not for me. I stay away. I create borders. I create boundaries. That's the love. The love is describing their vivid understanding and appreciation of how poisonous this is. And this is a very critical component that a person should be able to have that awareness, that clarity. What is yes and what is no? What is hain and what is love? Similarly, we have a story, a famous story in Gemara Masechus Shabbos that there was a non-Jew who came to Shammai and he said, teach me the whole Torah while I'm standing on one foot. This is Shabbos, page 31, the Flamad Aleph. So Shammai says, binyan. he had a stick, a contractor stick that was used for real estate to measure plots and properties and he pushed him away, he threw him away. He basically said, out. So he came to Hillel. And he said, teach me the whole Judaism on one foot. So Hillel said, no problem. How much time do you have? He said, six seconds. He said, you got it. I'll do it in four. <laughs> I'll do it in four seconds. And he said six words. How long does that take? Whatever you dislike to be done to you, don't do it to anybody else. Treat other people the way you would like to be treated. Speak to other people the way you would like to be spoken to. Relate to other people the way you would like to be related to. That's the whole Torah. Everything else is commentary. Go study the commentary. At first glance, it looks like Shammai had no patience. Don't come to me and say, teach me the whole Judaism when you're standing on one foot. Go to Harvard Medical School and say, teach me everything about there is to know about medicine in the next 25 seconds. Get out! People are researching biology for 4,000 years and you, the Chari, the Chacham of Chelem, in 20 seconds you're going to teach me everything there is to know about cosmology, about science, about physics, about psychology, philosophy, and math, and algebra, and engineering, and geology in 20 seconds. Yeshikoyach. Boom, get out. I don't have patience for nudniks like you. It's also disrespectful. People are sitting for, for years to study something you want in 20 seconds. Hillel we see as the quintessence of a kind Alta Zayda who had patience and he was very calm and he was very cool and he was very collective and he was very sensitive and he said no problem. The problem is that Shammai says in Pirkei is the first chapter we just learned before Shavuos You should greet every person nicely. Shammai is the one who said that. The most important things to know about the sages is that they did not ever believe that you could say one thing and do the opposite. <laughs> Hypocrisy has no place in a life of Torah. Do as I say and not as I do. There was a professor in Cambridge University. His name was Bertrand Russell. He died not long ago, an old man. He was a very smart man, a philosopher, an atheist. And he was caught doing uh, not such maizim toivim in terms of relationships, a lot of scandals. And he taught ethics. So one of his students says, Professor Russell, how do you teach ethics when it's quite well known that you're not the most ethical human being? He looked at his student and he said, I also teach trigonometry, I also teach algebra, and I'm not a circle. <laughs> I have to be a circle to teach about circles? That's what he said. He was arguing I can teach things I don't believe in. I can teach things I don't practice. I'm teaching it. I mastered it. In Yiddish guy, that has no place. Because it's actually the teaching is also flawed. Even the teaching is flawed. Shammai says, greet everybody with a pleasant face. 
So this guy comes and says, teach me Judaism in six seconds, in 20, how long do, could you stand on one foot? I don't know, it depends if you're a ballerina, but how long, how long can a person stand on one foot? Let's say 30 seconds. If a person is an athlete, they'll sign a few minutes, but not for very long. Even people who are trained their entire lives. Okay, you could do it. For, teach me the whole time. So Shama could say, listen, listen, my dear human being, Maybe you mean well, but this is a very serious... Uh, Jews have been studying Torah for 4,000 years, for 3,000 years. In Shammai's time, it was 2,000 years. It's not something for 20 seconds. And that's it. One of the explanations in this is that Shammai actually was not throwing him away. Shammai was preparing him for Hillel. Shammai was teaching him something very, very profound. Shammai was t- giving him the first foundation of Torah. Torah is based on hain and based on love. There's mitzvahs essay, there's mitzvahs loisasa. Every relationship has a yes, but has a no. Somebody who can say no, also can say yes. Somebody says, I'm going to go to the gym two hours a day, I want to lose weight, I want to look perfect, but afterwards, a pie of pizza. Before that, babka and cheesecake. I want both, but then I'm going to the It's not going to work. Every positive relationship needs to include protecting yourself from the negative influences that will undermine that relationship. Somebody says, proposes and says, I want to be married to you, I want to love you, but my options remain open. (laughs) If there's no exclusivity in the relationship, it undermines the positivity of the relationship. In other words, for it to be real and enduring, there also has to be a love. If a life of meaning means I embrace positive things, this is a lifestyle that I'm embracing, I also have to be able to say, love, this is something that does not belong to me. This is something that I must protect myself from. This is something that is toxic and poisonous. When people become pure, when they purify themselves, when they work on themselves, they right away know some relationships you get deeper into. And some relationships, it's time to uh, pull the plug. I should be nice to every person, but there are relationships that I can cultivate and really celebrate, and there are relationships, and relationships that deplete me, relationships that teach me how bad I am, relationships that are toxic and contaminating. A person has to be able to say love. And it's not about saying, it's the inner experience. This is something that builds me, and this is something that demolishes me. This is something that builds my holiness and goodness. This is an atmosphere. Where, where, where there's purity, where there's, this is an atmosphere where there's unfortunately toxicity. So Rabbi Yishmael says the experience of Matan Torah was so real. al hein hein. Alav. Hashem said, Lo yisirtzach. Lo yiyelecha lekem acherem. Lo yisana v'reachai tshoka. Lo yisisa shem Hashem alakecha. Lo yisinof. Lo yisignoif. Etc. Lo yisachmoit. They're being screened Of course love. Eh, feh. Of course not. What's that to do with me? This is, we, this, is so, this, is, this is alien for me. When Shammai taught this to him, now he can go to Hillel. And Hillel could tell him the positive. Treat other people like you want to be treated. Shammai gave him the foundation. If I have a new house and the house is filthy, you don't bring in the new furniture until you bring in a cleaning crew to clean out the filth. People make that mistake. They bring in all the, everything, but the dirt is still here. You got to clean out the dirt and then bring in the furniture. If there's a chorva, you got to gut the place in order to build a new house. I don't want to gut. If you don't want to gut, there's going to be leaks, there's going to be problems. I want to work with what is. Very nice, if you could. But if there's mold. So this is what Shammah was teaching him. You want the whole turn around, the first thing you're going to have to learn how to push away things. Bamas If you want to build yourself, there's going to have to be things that you push away. Now we could come to Hillel. And teach him the t- teach him the positive, because the Torah is based on two things: anoichi and leyilacha, mitzvus esse, mitzvus loisasa. So Rabbi Shmuel says, by Aseris Ibris, they already had that experience: al hein hein v'alav lav, because they were focusing on the impact, on the internal response of the Jew to these particular mitzvahs. This is a hein, this is a lav. Comes Rabbi Akiva and says, that's true, but there was something even deeper that happened. And that is, Rabbi Akiva says, everything was hain. They weren't focusing on what's being said. They were focusing on who's saying it. If you're focused on what's being said, Loisertzach is a big, big no. And Kabe de Savicha or Zachar, Shema Shabbos or Anoichi is a big, big yes. 
Rabbi Akiva says they were focusing on who was saying it, not on what was being said. Not the what, but the who. So Rabbi Akiva said everything was hain. Everything was yes. By Kabeda Savicha or Anoichi, by the positive ones, they said Al Hain Hain. Va'alav, even the negative ones, what was the experiencing? The experience was, this is what you want. Hain, yes. That was the focus. There's a beautiful Pasuk, it's a very emotional Pasuk about David HaMelech, whose yard said is on Shruas. When David's son, Avshalom, rebelled against him, as we discussed in the previous year with Achisoifel, who went to Avshalom. So Avshalom saw, rebelled against his father David, and David was forced to leave the palace in Yerushalayim and escape for his life. Because Avshalom came with his people and David would have been killed, so he ran away from Yerushalayim. As he ran away from Yerushalayim, so the Kayan was speaking to him, Tzadik HaKayan, you know, about his, about his fate, if he's ever going to come back. And David HaMelech says to him, in the Navi, he says, it's in Shmuel Beis, in the Prokim of the Tess, Yudala, Tesvav, Tezayin, Yudzayin, is the story of Shalom's rebellion. So David tells Avshalom, David tells the Kayan, his close friend, he says, if Hashem wants me to come back to the throne and go back to Yerushalayim, I'm in. And then he says, Vim hineni. If Hashem says, I don't want you to be here anymore, hineni. it's the same hineni. In other words, David HaMelech says, I'm not particular exactly how it's going to work out. I'm a conduit. How can David say this? Because David... <clears throat> It says in Tehillim that David says, You can testify that I remain completely silent. I'm like the soul of a gummel, of a suckling infant being held in its mother's bosom. When a mother is traveling with her baby, her infant, the mother could be traveling east or west, south, north. The mother could go here, could go on one flight, another flight go from country to country, if you would be able to speak to the infant, and you'll ask the infant, where were you all this time? Did you go with mommy to Yerushalayim? Did you go with mommy to London? Did you go with mommy to China? He says, I don't know, I was just with my mother. <laughs> so David HaMelech says, if he wants me to come back, I'll come back. And that's what Rabbi Akiva is teaching. Rabbi Akiva is teaching that the Jewish people were saying it's not a nafkim and the difference between the positive and the negative is in the software. It's how my avoid expresses itself. But in terms of the hardware, it's the same thing. This is what you want? Yes, hey. They didn't see the distinction. Here you're involved with positive things. Here you're running away from negative things. That's all a distinction when you're talking about your own experience of it in terms of the software. In terms of the core, I'm fulfilling your desire. Now you want me to be involved in this is Hineni. And if now it's the opposite thing, also Hineni, Hain, it's positive. It's similar to the famous story about the two brothers, Reb Zusha and Reb Melimelech. They were two students of the Magad of Mizrich. Two of the great Hasidic masters, the Rebbe Reb Melech, the author of Noyim Ali Melech, and his brother was Reb Zusha Vanipoli. They say a story, they would do gullahs, they would go around from city to city, they wouldn't sleep in one place more than one night. Anyway, somebody informed upon them and they were thrown into a dungeon. There were two saintly brothers, the Rebbe Reb Ali Melech of Lezhensk and Reb Zusha Vanipoli. Over there in that prison cell, you'll forgive me, this is the 1700s, there was no bathroom. They had a, a bucket in the corner of the room, and that's what the prisoners used to tend to their needs. So you can imagine the nature of the fragrance that pervaded the cell, to put it mildly. It came the morning, and Reb Zusha sees Reb Melech, his brother Reb Eli Melech, is crying. So he said, like Rabbi Akiva said, why are you crying? So he said, <laughs> similar answer, he says, I daven every day. The halacha is, you're not allowed to say kriya shma, you're not allowed to say brachas, you can't mention Hashem's name, in a place where there's a horrible odor. And when you're in the present of, of, when you're present of, of this type of fertilizer, you're not allowed to daven. Out of respect, v'hoya machanecha kodesh, the posseh in parashas kiseitze. So therefore I'm crying, the first time I won't be able to daven, because of the horrible smell. So Reb Zusha tells to Reb Elimelech, so this is the first time for everything. So why are you crying? He says, how can I have a day without davening? Davening is a time that I connect to the soul of the world, to my inner soul, 
to the core of reality. Davening is a time when I become one with oneness. When I become aligned with the core of all of existence, with the ultimate reality, which is Hashem Yisbarach. And this is the first time I don't have that relationship. I'm like alone in the world, scattered, frazzled. So the Zusha tells to the Melech, he says, I don't understand you. Who says you don't have a relationship today? The same God who wants you to daven every day. In Shulchan Aruch and in Torah, he says clearly that when there's a horrible odor, it's a place where there's filth, you're not supposed to daven. So today, you're not davening to fulfill Hashem's will. By fulfilling Hashem's will, you build a relationship with them. So every day you have a relationship with Hashem through davening, and today you'll have a relationship with Hashem through not davening. Who says it's not a relationship? It's a different type of relationship. So Melech says, I didn't think of it. So instead of crying, he starts singing. They were two chassidim, so within a few minutes they were dancing. So imagine a scene, you have two brothers in a prison cell, dancing away, and the guy, the Gentiles saw, so they all joined the dance, and in five minutes it looked like Simchas Torah, or Purim in the prison cell. The prison warden hears the commotion, he goes in, he sees everybody is dancing, Kazatskas, it's Lebedic, you would think it's a wedding. He's very annoyed, he calls over one of the inmates and he says, what's the, what's the Simcha, what's the joy? So as usual he says, the Jews are guilty, they instigated the whole thing. They're always guilty. So he says, why are they dancing? He says, I don't know, some mystical reason. He says, tell me right now, why are they dancing? Or I'll put you in solitary confinement. So he points to the bucket. In fear, he points to the bucket in the corner. He says, that's why they're dancing. So the prison warden says, could anybody explain to me how that bucket makes people dance? So he says, they explained that the bucket allowed them to experience a new relationship with their God. There was a pre-bucket relationship and there's a post-bucket relationship. And because of the post-bucket relationship, that's a new relationship, it got them into ecstasy and they're dancing away. He says, really? I will teach those Jews a lesson. And what does he do? Picks up the bucket and throws it out of their cell. So the Bzusha turns to the belly Melech and says, Bruder, yet can start Ibn Davin. <laughs> Brother, now you can start davening. What was the message here? A very deep message. The relationship is always present. The question is not if there's a relationship. The question is simply the format of the relationship. Here, sometimes the relationship is through davening. And sometimes Hashem says, today I don't want you davening. When Moshe Rabbeinu breaks the luchas to save the Jewish people, Hashem says, Sometimes I want the whole luchas. And sometimes I want after the broken luchas. So David HaMelech says, I'm here. So Rabbi Akiva says, it's all hain. It's all part of a relationship. Sometimes the relationship looks one way. Sometimes the relationship looks other way, in another different way. Sometimes the relationship is expressed in a positive relationship. I'm engaging with something that is holy and amazing and beautiful and sacred and divine and transcendent. That's hain. Sometimes it's love. Sometimes I'm faced with an opportunity where I'm dealing with something that is toxic, negative, poisonous. It's love. Rabbi Akiva says, don't focus on the what only, focus on the who. There's a connection here. This is his, you're, you are now sent here to fulfill this mission through this. Don't get obsessed and caught up in the particular issue. Ask not what God can do for you. Ask what you can do for God. If this is what's necessary at this moment, so it says, hey, not anything else. So Rabbi Akiva focuses on the connection, on the opportunity for connection. The opportunity for connection is in every nekudah. Sometimes it's through engagement, sometimes it's through disengagement. Sometimes it's through going, sometimes it's through not going. Sometimes it's through hain, things that are positive, and sometimes it's through dealing with something that's negative, whatever I have to do there. But it's also a hain, it's also a yes. This is my mission now, how I connect to my true mission, to my true purpose, to my God, to Hashem. Let's take it a step deeper. It's not just an argument about how I feel about it. Am I focusing on the software, the hardware? Am I focusing on what I'm doing? Or I'm focusing on what Hashem, that the fact that Hashem is asking me to do it. Which we can understand very well in a relationship. It's a very powerful idea. Sometimes there's a very deep relationship between two people. So it's no difference what you ask me. <laughs> you can ask me to do something. You can ask me not to do something. You can ask me to go here. You can ask me to go there. If I'm focusing on the actual act, I say, oh, this is great, this is not great. But if I'm focusing on the relationship, it's, hey, yes, yes. This is a yes, and this is a yes. If this is what you want, I'm in, I'm yes. 
There's also something deeper, and that is how they view the negative itself. How they view the law of itself. It says by Matan Torah, Vayered Hashem al Harsinai. Hashem came down on Harsinai. It says, Vel Moshe Amr Alei al Hashem. He told Moshe to go up. This means two things happened. God comes down, and humanity ascends. And in that process, your question is, what becomes the most powerful element? According to Rabbi Shmuel, it's Vayered Hashem. According to Moshe, it's El Moshe, according to Rabbi Akiva, it's El Moshe Amr Alei al Hashem. According to Rabbi Shmuel, it's Hashem coming down. According to Rabbi Akiva, it's the human being going up. It's not just physically coming down or going up. We're talking about spiritually two paradigms. Coming down means that godliness comes down to become tangible and internalized in the human experience. Going up means that the human being ascends to see things from the divine perspective. And that's why... Rabbi Shmuel says, the focus is from the human experience. So this is positive, this is negative. al hey nein, al lav lav Rabbi Akiva says, al al Hashem. He sees it from the divine. This is Hashem's will. This is Hashem's will. Like Rabbi Abzusha said, today he wants you, some days he wants you to daven. The same God wants you not to daven. You could celebrate that as much as you celebrate anything else when you see it from that perspective. But here we come to the next step, and that is how they see the very essence of negativity. To say this briefly, because it's a profound idea, <coughs> the Gemara says in Masech Sukkah Dafnun Beis that there's three things that Hashem regrets every day. Gimel Dvarim Hashkadosh Baruch Hu Meschart Aleim B'Chol Yoyim, and one of them is the Yitzharah. <laughs> he regrets the Yitzharah, the evil inclination. And there's a pasuk he says, "Asher Harei Oisi, I'm the one who's guilty in creating all these messes and all the negativity because I created the Yitzharah." The question is, I don't understand. So, I understand I do something, I make a mistake, I regret what I did. Huh? And you stop. And you stop. First of all, if Hashem is so, is so regretful, why did He make it? And if He made it and He decided it's a really bad idea, so how didn't He realize it? And if He did realize it, so He did it anyway, so obviously there's a purpose. And if something happened and He said, you know, this is a really bad idea, so take it away. You regret it, and then you don't take it away. So how much, if I regret, I say, I'm, I'm really sorry about what I did, and then I do it the next day. And then I say, I'm sorry again, and then I do it the next day. How sorry am I? We all know what that means. I'm sorry, but here we go again. <laughs> Flip service. So what do you say, Mishcharit? The answer to this is a very profound answer. And that is, he created it because he wanted to create it, obviously. He thought it serves a purpose. What purpose does it serve? Understanding that he regrets it, that's the purpose that it serves. And I'll explain what I mean. Everything in the world exists because Hashem wants it to exist. That's its energy. God's will translates into energy. He wants, therefore it is. In other words, Hashem's ruts, and that's what makes the energy that it should exist. If the Yetz Sahara, its whole purpose is to tell you to go against Hashem's will, so how can it exist? <laughs> It's existing because of Hashem's will. So Hashem wants it to exist. And that's what makes everything exist. The chemistry of everything in the world is the divine will that it should exist. That is its battery. That is its engine. But if the whole very existence of it is to compel a person, to influence a person, to go against the Creator's will, so there's a paradox here. Because how do you live? The oxygen that everything has is the divine will that it should live. So the Sahara lives off the divine will it should be. What's its whole purpose? Its whole purpose is to take people away from that divine will. So that's a very fascinating paradox in the Yetzirah. So this is what the Gemara is saying. Hashem creates it, and He says, I regret that I created it. That regret is what defines the chemistry of the Yetzirah. It's something that Hashem wants, and He could say, I regret that. In other words, the very fact that he says, I regret it, regret it, makes it a reality. The Yetzirah doesn't have a reality. Pre-creation is only Hashem. How does the Yetzirah have a reality? Hashem says, I'm creating something. What is it that I'm creating? Something that I don't like. <laughs> something that I'm regretting. So the very nature of its existence is that God wants, God wants something, I'm creating it. What is it that I'm creating? I'm creating something that I don't want. The fact that he says, I don't want this, that itself is a relationship. Think about a person. Something that I'm disconnected to, I don't want, I don't not want. If you say, I don't want something, 
there's a relationship here, right? If something uh, makes you queasy and you don't feel good about it, there's obviously a relationship, it triggers you. When somebody is triggered by somebody, they have some connection. It's not a positive connection, but it's a connection. So the very fact that God says something triggers me, that makes it exist. <laughs> that, makes, that gives it its energy. That gives it its oxygen. Pre-creation, it didn't trigger, it didn't exist. It says in Medrash that Hashem built worlds. He built worlds before this world. He destroyed them. He said, these I like and these I don't like. The Medrash says this in Berejus. These I like, these I don't like. The very fact that he said, I don't like this, that is its oxygen. Because he confers existence on it, even negative existence. The very fact I say, this is something I don't like. This is something that does not sit well with me. This is something that defies me. Oh, it's something <laughs> that defies me. It has substance. Somebody triggers you, they do something, right? They have something. When you really say, oh, I really don't care, and you get upset, of course you care. If you wouldn't care, you wouldn't get upset. I, I try to make believe I don't care, <laughs> but of course I care. The very fact that you say, I don't like something, means that there is something here that you don't like. So how does negativity live? If everything lives from Hashem, so how can negativity live? How can Ra have an existence? How can something that's antithetical to divine holiness have existence? It's also created from Hashem. But if everything lives because of Hashem's want and Hashem's desire... It's an expression of Hashem. So how could there be a mitzvah in the world, a reality in the world, that its very identity is what? Antithetical to godliness. And what's giving it its identity? Godliness. So Hashem is giving it oxygen. And what is it doing with that oxygen? It's defiance of God. And yet that is also is godly. So the pshat is that essentially what negativity really is, It's powerful. It comes from God. But what is its very substance? Its very substance is that Hashem says, I don't want it. (laughs) That's what it really is. In other words, it creates a reality in the world that on its own, it doesn't really have anything. Even when God creates it, what is He creating? He's creating something that ultimately doesn't have real power, doesn't have real energy. So what's its purpose? Its purpose is only to challenge and stimulate the human being to be able to overcome it, to be able to transform it, to be able to eradicate it, to be able to sublimate it. Here comes the difference between Rabbi Shmuel and Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Shmuel says, Al hain hain va lav lav. On the positive, they said hain. On the negative, they said lav. Rabbi Akiva goes to a deeper place. Rabbi Akiva didn't see lav. Rabbi Akiva saw in everything what's the divine purpose inside of it, because that is also being created by Hashem. Hashem is creating something that He says, I don't want. So if you look at the outside of it, it's negative. Inside, there's also a spark of holiness. What is that spark of holiness? That spark of holiness is that God put something here that its entire purpose is to be able to create some type of resistance that you should overcome, that you should transform, that you should eradicate. And therefore, it doesn't really have any substance of negativity. It's all another way, another opportunity in which to fulfill God's will. So when you look at love, when you look at anything negative in the world, you could see two things. When you look at it from the perspective of Ayyirid Hashem al Sinai, Hashem came down. The way it sees from our experience, this is positive, this is negative. When you look at it from the perspective of Al-Mosh Amar Alei, there was an opportunity to go up. Can you see it from the divine perspective? When the divine looks at it, what does he see? He sees something that was created completely through holiness. If it was created completely through holiness, so what's giving it oxygen? Holiness is giving it oxygen. And yet what is it at the surface? At the surface it's the opposite of holiness. So Rabbi Akiva says, Alav hain. In the love they also saw the hain. What they saw was not negativity in and of itself. They could see the divine purpose and perspective in the negativity that it's all there in order to be able to bring out something positive in a person's life, to be able to create a life in which the relationship is real and authentic, in which I overcome this negativity, whatever this negativity may be. So I could look at it from the outside, it's love. You look at it from a deeper perspective, from Hashem's perspective, and what does Rabbi Akiva see in the love? He says, it's not a love, love, it's a love, hain. 
The love is also a hain. And this is what you see in these stories of Rabbi Akiva. They come and they see a fox coming out of the Holy of Holies. What do they see? They see Khurban. They also believed in the Gula. But right now they see a fox coming out of the Holy of Holies. So you cry. The fact that one day there'll be redemption. Beautiful. But right now we're crying. That makes a lot of sense. There's Hain Hain and there's Lav Lav. There's things you laugh about. There's things you cry about. Comes Rabbi Akiva and says, no. I love Hain. He didn't see Lav. He saw Hain. In the fox coming out of Holy of Holies, what did he see? He saw it as a springboard, as a catalyst, as a testifier that That's why he uses the Nevuah of Uriyah, Tzi and Sada Techarish. Zion will be plowed like a field. Unfortunately, there's a lot of prophecies of doom in the Nevi'im. Why does he choose this one? Because plowing is a very interesting phenomenon. If somebody plows a field at the, one, at the surface, what are they doing? They're breaking it up. They're destroying it. It's like demolishing a house. What are you destroying my house for? The tractors are coming and literally taking apart your house. Stop destroying my field. Stop destroying my house. But anybody who understands the deeper element, what is plowing? Plowing is making it fertile. If you don't plow and you plant the seeds, nothing is going to grow. By shaking it up, by breaking it up, by destroying it, demolishing it, you can actually create a fertile field. So Rabbi Akiva says, Tzio in Sada Techarish. It's not that he believed in the future there'll be the Gula. They also believed that. He saw in the Techarish, in the plowing, he saw the growth. Not because he didn't understand what's happening. He didn't understand that this is Khurban. Allah Hain, when he saw the negative, he saw in it the divine purpose, the divine spark in it. And what's the divine spark even in that? It's not that the evil should be powerful. That's why all evil ultimately fades away. It has no power of eternity. Even the strongest empires of evil, by definition, they're all temporary. Why? Like the Navi says, everything will wither like grass. Why is that? The answer is because what is the power of evil? The power of evil can't be eternal and can't be absolute because its entire power is God's desire that it shouldn't be. <laughs> And everything lives off Hashem. And if Hashem says, I don't want, don't want this. So its power is, in Kabbalah and Chassidus is an expression, Ra is Heder. Evil in its core is non-existent. Well, it's non-existent, really? At its core, it's non-existent. It looks like it exists very powerful and it has tremendous power. Communism for 70 years was an evil empire that ruled the world. Talk about Rome, others, they were called Malchus or Rasha Rome. But at its core, if you get down to the DNA, look at it. And you'll see its whole, its whole existence is Hashem wanting it. What does He want? He says, this I don't want. So its very oxygen is that it has no oxygen. You understand what I'm saying? Its oxygen is that it has no oxygen. It lives over the fact that it has no life. It fakes it. That's its life. Because everything comes from Hashem. So how does it live? <laughs> it lives Hashem says, this I don't want. But he says, I don't want. So that itself is a reality. Hashem is giving something power. He's saying, this I don't want. The fact that he says, I don't want, that's his oxygen. <laughs> because if he would really, if he wouldn't even say, I don't want it, then it wouldn't exist. <laughs> the fact that he could say, express it, this I don't want. Oh, so there's a this that you don't want. There's already a relationship. You just created something. <laughs> you just gave it dignity. You just gave it significance. You just gave it life. That's what it means. He regrets the Yitzhahara. That's, that's its creation. I'm creating something. I say, I really hate this. I hate this. So on one hand, it exists. If God hates it, it must exist. What's its existence? That it doesn't exist. Its existence is, Hashem says, it's not me. In other words, it's not real. So ultimately, it's going to fade away. Its whole purpose is to be able to create a catalyst and a springboard for transformation for choice, for human creativity, for a person cleaning out the negative from the positive. So it can have power, but ultimately it fades away. There's no real substance to it. All evil will clip it, it's a cover-up. And therefore, ultimately, it doesn't have eternity. Ultimately, the more truth gets revealed, it just goes away. It doesn't have real power, it doesn't have real substance. People who have real vision, even when it seems powerful, they don't get affected by it. So Rabbi Yishmael focuses on the experience of man. There's toiv and there's ra. Al hain hain v'alav lav. Comes Rabbi Akiva and says, Al hain hain v'alav also hain. What do you mean? Is the fox coming out of the Holy of Holies? 
He sees it from the divine purpose, from the divine perspective. So therefore it's Hain. He doesn't see the love. He sees the hate. He sees the purpose that God created it, which is the plowing that is a preparation. It's a springboard for the redemption. And then in the last story, what happens? The Romans take him out to be killed. It's the worst love in history. The worst negativity in history. And he's saying, Shema. Talmudim say, At Khan, At Khan. What were they so surprised? They never heard of a Jew in the land. There were Jews not on the level of Rabbi Akiva much lower than Rabbi Akiva, who in their last moments, they said Shema Yisrael. Daniel Pearl was married to a non-Jew, was abducted by, I- by ISIS, you remember? And they videoed his last moments, and he said, I'm a Jew. The Talmidim looked at Rabbi Akiva, what did they think? Rabbi Akiva lost his amun at that moment? <laughs> oh, I'm not Jewish anymore. Everything was a mistake. Rabbi Akiva was a holy Jew. He said Shema Yisrael, his last moments. What the Talmudim were saying, were asking was something much deeper. They saw that Rabbi Akiva felt the Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekeinu Hashem Echot in the experience. They said, At Khan, come on. This is a proof that God is not one. If God was one, how could the Romans do this? That's what they asked. At Khan, it, we see from your face that you're experiencing this as part of Hashem Echot. That doesn't make sense. So Rabbi Akiva answered, Rabbi Akiva said, every day when I said, I always ask myself, when will I be able to fulfill this mitzvah? Now I have an opportunity to fulfill this mitzvah. You want I shouldn't fulfill it? What was he telling them? What he was saying was, what I see in this experience is an opportunity to love God with all my soul. He didn't see the love, he saw the hain. Even in the most negative, dark experiences, he saw his mission and his opportunity to become close to truth, to authenticity. I do so much negativity in the world. He saw in the love the opportunity, the invitation to fulfill a mitzvah of Hashem That's what he saw. His soul went out in Echad. His soul went out in the experience of Echad. Not just the word Echad. Everything was one. Our love is also hain. So we, even when a Jew is disengaging, Rabbi Akiva doesn't see this is evil and I'm staying away from it. Rabbi Akiva sees in everything the echad, the oneness. Even the negativity, he sees it. From the perspective of the divine, the nitzutz kedusha, the godly spark that animates it and vivifies it and gives it existence. Because the only way it can exist is because Hashem wants it to exist. But what is this existing? Something that's defying God. Something that Hashem says, I don't want, and that itself is His existence. So He saw, what's the divine opportunity here? What's the divine mission here? What does Hashem want here? He didn't see it as a separate realm. There's light and there's darkness. He saw everything as light. Some things look like light, and some things you have to reveal the light in it. That's it. He didn't see light and darkness. I'll hate my love. Everything is light. Some things the light is apparent, and some things the light is so deep. It's so concealed, I'm the one who has to reveal it. Rabbi Shmuel was born a Jew. He wasn't only born a Jew, he was a Kayan. Not only that, some say he was a Kayan Gadol, Rabbi Shmuel Kayan Gadol. It's a question if it's the same Rabbi Shmuel, if it was a grandson, a son, a grandson. Was he a Kayan Gadol in the Beis Hamikdash? Was it the next generation? Certainly he was a Kayan from the family of Kayan Amgadolim. The job of a Kayan is they grow, they grow up as Jews, they live as Jews, they come from Aaron Kayan. And the job of the Kayan, the Pazaz, they teach Torah to the Jewish people. Rabbi Akiva's experience was the exact opposite. Rabbi Akiva came from non Jews. The Gemara says in Sanhedrin Sadegvav that Zayda, Elta, Elta, Elta Zayda was Sisra, the arch enemy of the Jewish people. He came from Sisra, one of the worst enemies of the Jewish people. That was Rabbi Akiva. If you take a look in the third source, Hagdama Saram of the Mishnah Torah, Rabbi Akiva ben Yosef, Kiba mi Rabbi Leza Agadol ve Yosef Aviv Ger Tzedek Haya the Rambam says. Rabbi Akiva was the son from of Yosef. His Rebbe was Rabbi Eliezer the Great, and his father Yosef was a Ger Tzedek. He was a convert. He was a convert. So two things, as a convert, and as a son of converts, he needed to find godliness. In places that Abishmal didn't have to find it. 
He went down into those places. He started off, his family started off as non-Jews, ultimately the genes of Sisera. And from there he came to holiness. He found a spark of Hashem in the lowest of places. But now to the other side. The Rambam writes, there's a convert, his name was Rebbe Vadia. And he complained to the Rambam how he's mistreated by the Jews in the community because he's a ger. And there was a rabbi who said not nice things to him. So the Rambam says, the only justification I could find for that rabbi is that he was drunk. And he should fast to be masakim what he did. And then the Rambam says, all Jews trace their lineage to Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, or Leah, Bila, Zilpa. A ger doesn't trace their lineage to Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. They may come from Avram through Esav or through Yishmal. They may come from Yitzchak through Esav, but not Yaakov. Or they may come generally from a different family. <laughs> Maybe from one of Terach's other kids or from other families, from other nations that spread after Noach. So he says, a ger can't go say, I'm a Ben Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov. He says, a ger that traces his or her lineage directly directly to Hashem. Directly. And that's why the Rambam says, the Gemara says, Ger is like a newborn child. Even if he's 40, 50, she's 60 years old when they convert, it's like a newborn child. Who's Tati and Mami? And the answer is, biologically, they have a father and mother, but spiritually, it's directly a child of Hashem. Because Rabbi Akiva was a Ben Gerim, and because Rabbi Akiva himself was a Baltruva, so his entire life came from the lowest of the low and he reached the highest of the high. So Rabbi Akiva's life was Masa Yavaladi Vekamenu, was a life of complete transcendence directly to the divine. So he saw everything from that perspective. So on the negative, he said, hey, it's an opportunity for a relationship. And even when there's negative in the world, he saw, hey, and he saw the divine perspective. Hmm. And here you see it in an extraordinary way. There's an argument between Rabbi Shmuel and Rabbi, Shmuel and Rabbi Akiva argue in dozens and dozens and dozens of places, maybe hundreds throughout the Talmud. And there's a line that pervades dozens and dozens of their arguments. <laughs> Do you see it from a human perspective or from a divine perspective? Vayered Hashem al Sinai, al Moshe Amar Alei al Hashem. Hashem came down, Moshe went up. There was a synthesis. So there was integration. The question is, what becomes more emphasized? And Elu Ve'elu Divrei Elokim Chayim, both are real experiences. We have to make space for both. One of the interesting arguments you have it in your sources, Amalei Yibri Shmuel, Dibra Torah Kel Hashem B'nei Adam. Yibri Shmuel says, when there's a repetition in Chumash, you don't have to deduce any new laws. God speaks in the language of people. People repeat themselves. <laughs> Rabbi Akiva says, Loi Dibra Torah Kel Hashem B'nei Adam. God doesn't repeat himself. If he repeats himself, it's to teach you a law. What's the argument? Again, we have to argue about everything. You see the depth there. Rabbi Akiva says, Rabbi Shmuel, Hashem speaks in the language of people. He came down. Rabbi Akiva says, no, we got to go up. He doesn't speak in the language. The Bnei Adam could become divine. Here we come to an extraordinary, fascinating interpretation by Rabbi Shimshon Astrapala. Shimshon Astrapala was one of the greatest Kabbalists in Jewish history. He was killed in the 1648 pogroms, Xerius Tachvetat by Chmelanetsky, Bogdan Chmelanetsky's forces, the Cossacks. You heard of Xerius Tachvetat? He was in Pulna in Ukraine. Gimel of and Shul, they killed Rabbi Shimshon Astropala. His svarim are extraordinary svarim. And he has an unbelievable rem at the end of Parshas Bechukaisai. Look at it. Bechukaisai Perik Chavzayin Pasek Lamed Beis. This had to come with Ruach HaKadosh because I don't know a human being could come up with this on his own. Bechukaisai Chavzayin Beis. It says in svarim, it says in Zohar, it says in, uh, it says in Zohar that the ten shvatim were reincarnated into the Asara Ruge Malchus. The ten people, the ten sages killed by the Romans. We know the story, we say it on Yom Kippur, and Tisha the Roman emperor called in the sages and he said, what's the punishment for, for abducting a, cha, a Jew and selling him? And they said, death. And he said, who was punished for abducting Yosef and selling him as a slave? You should take responsibility for that, the Roman emperor said. And it says in Zoya that the Asara Ruge Malchus were an actual reincarnation of the Ten Shvatim. Their souls came into these ten people. And the Bishmal, it says, Tihir the Bishmal Atzmai. The Bishmal went up to heaven and he wanted to find out if this is a real decree and they said it is. And these ten great sages were killed. And the one of them was Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Shmuel. Uh-huh. There's a question if it's the same Rabbi Shmuel like this one or was a Zayda of his or different Rabbi Shmuel. That's a separate question. But Rabbi Shmuel and Rabbi Akiva was killed. Rabbi Akiva, everybody says, was one of the ten. So it's a very big questionnaire. 
How many brothers sold Yosef? Nine. <laughs> Reuven wasn't there. Benjamin was home. Yosef was the victim. There were 12 brothers. Three are gone. So you have nine. Would you have a surrogate in Malchus? It's a Gavaldika question. So the Arizal asked this question. And he says that when the Shvatim did it, they wanted a minion. Who did they take number 10? Hashem. They were so convinced that this is what God right, this is what God wants. They said, come join us, Hashem. And they even made a cherim, a ban against anybody revealing the story and telling the story. And for a cherim in a minion, they took Hashem as a minion. And Hashem agreed. Because he wanted Yosef sold for different reasons. He wanted Yosef ultimately to become the Prime Minister of Egypt and save the world. They did it for their reasons. God did it for his reasons. But they joined forces. Comes the Arizal and says, the Asara Ruge Malchus, the tenth one, represented Hashem. That's Rabbi Akiva. Why Rabbi Akiva? Because he was a Ben Geirim. He came from converts. The other Shvatim, the other ten, nine came from the Shvatim. They come from Reuven and Shim. Rabbi Akiva didn't come from the Shvatim. He wasn't from Reuven, not Shim and Levi, Yehuda, Yisachar, Zvul and Don, Naftali, God, Usher. He wasn't. He came from Sisri. He came from non-Jews. But he came directly from Hashem. He was a Ger, like God's child. So Rabbi Akiva represents Hashem in the sale of Yosef. That's Rabbi Akiva. He was a Ben Gadim his whole life. He had Masi Yod, Not only that, the Gemara says in Psachim 22, Shimon Ham Sunni explained every S in Chumash. Every S in Chumash, he explained what it means. In English, you don't have the word S. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Or the heaven and the earth. What's S? How do you say that in English? You won't find it in the translation. Respect the, the, your father, the, what does it mean? So Shimon Amsuni explained every S. And then he quit. Because he came to a Pasuk in Ve'eschanan, S Hashem Tira. You should fear God. So who does it include? <laughs> the other S's you could say, Kabed Es Avichav it includes your older brother, your older sister. S Hashem Tira. you fear God, and who else should you fear? President? So he said, I quit. I made a mistake. The year of Hashem applies to Talmud Chacham. How could Rabbi Akiva say this? Why did Shimon Amsuni not say it? Because Rabbi Akiva was teaching what a real Talmud Chacham is. A real Talmud Chacham is somebody who's egoless and completely one with God, a conduit for Hashem. So the fear of the Talmud Chacham is not a fear of a person who has an ego who could manipulate you. It is Yiris Hashem because of his complete bittel and selflessness. Rabbi Akiva was an embodiment of that, so he could say, So he represented Hashem in the tenth. Comes Rabbi Shimshon Astrapaler, and take a look at this pasuk. I told you this had to be said with Ruach HaKadosh. Not that I'm a maven in Ruach HaKadosh, but I know it would be hard for a regular human brain to come up with this. There's a din called Maise Behem. Maise Behem means that when I have new animals that are born in my farm, whether sheep or goats or, or cows, so 10%... I give mice, I bring to you a shalayim, and you offer it as a carbon, and you can eat it together with friends and family and relatives and poor people. The Gemara says, Rebbe Lazar ben Azariah, and Shabbos and Beitzer, Rebbe Lazar ben Azariah had 120,000 sheep that were born a year, so mice and would have been 12,000, 10%. So it says that you had a door, and you let every animal go down, and you counted 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then 10th, you said, this is mice, this is holy, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, everyone passed by, and then this, with a stick, and you... You counted one, two, three, four, and then the tenth became Kaidish. That's the Pasuk Rabbi Shimshon Astropoler focuses on. Every Pasuk has layers and layers of meaning. So take a look at this Pasuk. You see, V'chal ma'iser baka v'tzayin ko'ila sh'ya v'tachas ha'shavet ha'siri y'kaidish l'ashem. Literally, all the ma'iser, all the 10% of your cattle and your sheep, whatever goes under the scepter, because you stand with the stick, the tenth should be holy for Hashem. Now take a look at this Pasuk. Now look very clearly at Rabbi Shimshon Astropoler's interpretation. It's going to be a Rosh Tevis. It's going to be an acronym. Listen, it's going to be an acronym. Okay, now listen very carefully. Huh? It is, it is. The fourth, the fourth, the fourth source from the top. You see? One, two, three, four, five. Five lines from the top. You see? Look clearly. I'm going to say it fast and I'll repeat it slow. It's an acronym. Vikulam. I'm sorry. V'yedu 
Kulam, Lama, Meis, Akiva, Shahaya, Raya, Bakar, Vatsain. Again, Vichal. Viedu, Kulam, Lama, Meis, Akiva, Shahaya, Raya, Bakar, Vatsain. Let everybody know why did Akiva die, the one who was a shepherd of cattle and flock, sheep. Rabbi Akiva, we learned before, was a shepherd for many years. That was his vocation. Why did he die? Only nine brothers killed Yosef. You see how he reads it? V'yedu v'chal is V'yedu, acronym, V'yedu kulam lama, meiser, meis akiva, shin re, shahoya roya, boka v'tzoyin. Answers the pasa, question mark, answers the pasa, koil asher yavoy, all the other nine that were over that passed away, tachas hashevet, each one represented one of the nine shvatim, hasiri, yekoidosh l'ashem. The tenth, Rabbi Akiva, he's sacred for God. He represented God's roles in Mechiris Yosef. So here you see when you say that the ten guys, the Sarah Gemalchus, the ten Shvatim, they were sinners and they had atonement, you see even Hashem Kevayachal needed atonement. When we see pain in the world, it's not always, oh, he sinned, he got killed, he got tortured, he got hurt. Even Hashem is the one taking a kapara here, really? I thought God runs the world. He's the one who makes the mitzvahs. It's like the Gemara says in Chulim, page 60, God diminished the moon, and he says, make an atonement for me that I diminish the moon. Every Rish Chodesh, they brought a goat, and it says, La Hashem chatas for Hashem sin. How does Hashem sin? I know I could sin. How does Hashem sin? If he did it, he probably wants to do it. It's like we spoke before, when he creates the eight Sahari, he's creating something that he regrets. So if you're creating something he regrets, it, don't do it. That itself is what I want. I want something that I don't want because the whole purpose is it should ultimately be eliminated through the human creativity and through the human effort. So that's the that's the the So when Rabbi Akiva looks at Torah Mitzvahs, Rabbi Shmuel says Al Hain Hain Valav Lav. What does he see in the negative? It's negative. Stay away. Rabbi Akiva says, it's an opportunity to connect. It's God's will. Rabbi Shmuel looks at darkness in the world. He says, unfortunately, this is dark. Fox is coming out. Is a time to cry. And there's a space for that. That is what the human feels. That's Elu Vela Divre Lekem Chayim. Elu Vela Divre Lekem Chayim. In fact, Rashi in Chumash quotes only Rabbi Shmuel's opinion. Because when a person starts their spiritual growth, you have to have clear boundaries. This is good, this is not good. This is positive, this is negative. This stay away from, this don't know, stay away from. Rabbi Akiva teaches a deeper level of consciousness. In the lav he saw hain. It's just an opportunity to connect. It's It's what he wants from me at this moment. Today he wants me to daven, today he wants me not to daven. It's the same relationship. It's not focusing on my experience, it's focusing on what is Ratzin is. Deeper, when he sees the evil in the world, what does he see? He sees the spark of holiness that's even animating that level of darkness. Ultimately, there's some divinity there. What's the purpose of it? The purpose is just to bring to a deeper level of light, to a deeper level of Avaidus Hashem. For me, what's happening now? A mitzvah v'haftas Hashem alakecha b'chal nafshecha. I'm giving my soul to God. That's what he saw. He saw complete oneness in every single moment. And here we see, in the last source, the Rambam starts off the Mishnah Torah. So the last source, the Rambam starts off the Mishnah Torah. His whole Sefer, the Rambam starts off one of the most beautiful halachas, the center of Judaism, the essence of Judaism, the foundation. Rambam's immaculate words, the foundation of foundations, the pillar of wisdoms is to know that there's a Matsur Rishon. There's a first primary existence and he brings into existence every existence. And anything that exists from heaven to earth and in between did not emerge only from the truth of his existence. Beautifully said, this is the foundation of foundations and the pillar of wisdoms. Comes to Rambam in the next halacha and throws us an interesting curveball. And if you're going to entertain the idea that he's non-existent, there's no God, nothing else can exist. 
So people ask on the Rambam, what, is that exactly the seed you got to plant, the opening of the whole Mishnah Torah? The Rambam didn't entertain the idea that there's no God. What do you have to mention it? It's not true. By the way, if you're looking at me and you think that I'm a squirrel, you should realize that if I was a squirrel, I'm, I'm not a squirrel. <laughs> like, in Allah, <laughs> But the truth is, even if you want to say, yeah, the Rambam is wanting to address those people. There are atheists in the world. But the truth is, he said it in the first halacha. If he said that everything in the world exists from this existence, so obviously, what does that mean? If not for this existence, nothing else would exist. And people who want to say that even with existence, it doesn't prove God, the Rambam is anyway not answering their question. And he says, And the Rambam makes it a whole halacha. This is halacha base. One of the explanations, the deeper explanations, the Rambam is saying something very deep. He puts in the word shahu. If you would think that he is non-existence, in Hebrew you could have said, The Rambam is talking about when you look at reality and you see things in which you can't see his existence. You look at certain things and you say, here he's not. Not that there's no God, he's saying something much deeper. In certain things, who ain't matzi? Who? The he that exists, here he's not Matzai. This is too dark. This is too negative. This is above my pay grade. This is not, this is, this is off. Says the Rambam, Ein davar Even the most difficult of situations, if it exists, it's because he's here. Because every Nekuda in life and reality is existing only because of the Rats and the divine energy. The question is, what's the nature of its existence? If it's something that Hashem wants, it has real existence. It has eternal existence because he's invested in it. If it's something that exists because he doesn't want, its existence essentially is frail. It's superficial. It's transitional. It's temporary. Because what is its existence? That he doesn't want it. But it exists because he wants it to exist. So the Ramam is telling you, even when you come to a situation, you say, who ain't matzi? God is not here. This is a part of life where God is not present. The Rambam says, Ein davar acher Even a davar acher, the Rambam is, what, what, we, what do we call a davar acher? <laughs> a chazer, right? Because like a sa- it's davar acher, we don't even want to say it. A davar acher. says, even that davar acher, just does the Rambam. Literally means another thing. And we say when Mashiach comes, the chazer is going to become tahir. It's called chazer. Why is it called chazer? From the word chazara, asid lachzer. It's going to come back. Because it's going to be revealed. The nitzutz of holiness, even in the lowest of things. So even the Dover Acher, you're going to see it's existing only because of the nitzutz of Kedusha that's animating it. So therefore Rabbi Akiva says, I don't see love. I don't see love. Even in the Hu Eino Matsui, what did he see? Even in the Rome, in the Roman Empire. What did he see? So Ein Dover Acher Yochele Matzis. Even here what he saw was giving me an opportunity to fulfill the mitzvah of the Even here he saw the echad, he saw the oneness. Now you understand where Rabbi Akiva repeats al hein hein v'alav hein. I asked you, why does he repeat al hein hein? He agrees to Rabbi Akiva. Because even the hein is not like Rabbi Akiva. I'm like Rabbi Shmuel. Rabbi Akiva is not only arguing with Rabbi Shmuel on the love, he's also arguing on the hain. When Rabbi Shmuel says, you say on hain, hain, what he means is positive things. It's positive. You feel positive, so you say yes. When Rabbi Akiva says al hain, hain, what does he mean? That it's Hashem's will. So even the hain is a different hain. Rabbi Shmuel's hain is a hain because if it's a positive experience. It's a positive appearance. Rabbi Akiva's hain, al hain, is that everything is an akud of hain, of oneness, and practically, it's an opportunity to fulfill Hashem's will. So, of course, yes. Yes, I'm going to do what you want. Love, it's something negative. It's also saying what you want. And here comes the very powerful relevance of Rabbi Akiva's message to us. And Rabbi Akiva says sometimes in life, I think we can all relate to this, we're faced with things that are not our first choice. Let's put it mildly. I'll go back to my famous examples that you all know. Sometimes you have a child, and all you hear about this child is hain, 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 hain. Nachas, 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 nachas. I just made up a song in honor of Shavuos. 
Hain, 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 Hain. Yes, 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 yes. I want him. I want him. I want him in my school. I want him in my daycare. I want him in my chayda. I want him in my yeshiva. I want him in my sifta. I want him in my family as my son-in-law. And then there's another child. All you hear is what? Love. No, 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 no. It's like a boy told me that he was thrown out of ten yeshivas. I said, wow, you got to go into the Guinness Book of World Records. Ten. I said, but why so many? He looked at me and said, because everybody wants me. I'm like, I like that. I love him. Sometimes there's a person, one love, one love, one love. And then this chamber is true in our own life. There are experiences in life you could say, hey, hey, yes, yes, more, 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 more. And then there's love. This is one negative and another negative and another negative and another negative. And to say that they're just the same, Rabbi Shmuel says it's two different experiences. This is a hain and this is a love. Comes Rabbi Akiva and he says, The Kayach of Matan Teirav al Masha Amar Alei Al Hashem is the ability for a person to be able to look at love and say, This is also hain. And what does it mean that this is also hain? That if this is my journey, if this is my mission, to be able to embrace this person, to be able to love this child, to be able to build up this child, even though it's fraught with, such a, with so many obstacles, and it's a completely different journey. And some people will say, love, wrong, wrong, wrong journey. And the person has the ability to say, no, this is hain. And it's with the same simcha, with the same joy, that I'm going to do everything else. Because I'm not focusing on what my child can do for me. Ask not what your child can do for you. Ask what you can do for your child. If the question is what my child can do for me, you're disappointing me. If the question is what I can do for my child, this child needs much more. So I'm going to be more present. I'm going to be more fun. I'm going to be more enthusiastic. I'm going to be more connected. I, this one says it's love, and this one says love. By me, it's not love, it's hain. Rebbe Akiva says, this is him. Who knows what your mission is? If this is what Hashem wants, I should break the luchas. I'll break the luchas. If He wants me not to come back to Yerushalayim to lose my kingship, I don't work for myself. It's not about my ego. I work for Hashem. If this is my mission, this is my aim. I do it with the same simcha. If He wants me not to daven today, I'll do it with the same joy like davening. I, it's a whole different experience. You're in a dungeon, you're in a cell, it smells. I don't see a smell. I see hain. I also don't see smells. We smell smells. It's an important message. A woman wrote me a message. And she says, she goes to Shiurim before Shavuos and everybody says, how you have to explain how you have to fill the house with Torah. And that's a beautiful message. To fill the house with Torah. With learning Torah, with Svanim of Torah, with conversations of Torah. But then she describes to me her house. She has children struggling terribly emotionally and struggling with Yiddishkeit. And if she mentions Torah, she alienates them. So she has to fill her house with things that will allow her children to stay in the house and stay close to her. And she says, my Shabbos table does not have Divrei Torah. And I sit at Shiurim before Shavuos and I say, this doesn't relate to me. So now I'm talking to you. Hope you're listening. Comes Rebbe Akiva and says, there's a much deeper form of Matan Taira. One form of Matan Taira is the way it looks on the outside, al hain hain valav lav, this is negative, this is positive. Comes Rebbe Akiva and says, there's a deeper relationship with Taira. Taira doesn't always look the same way for all people. When Moshe breaks the luchas, Hashem says, Yashikai it's also Taira. Not only that, the whole Chamish Chum Shatayra ends with that story. Le'enei kol Yisro, Rashi says it's talking about the breaking of the luchas. It doesn't make sense, apparently. How should you end the Chumash? Something with Taira, right? How does it end? Breaking the luchas. Wow, great climax. <laughs> because Allah hain, the Chiddush of Moshe Rabbeinu, Alei al Hashem, says Rabbi Akiva was a Nitzitz of Moshe, a Gilgal of Moshe. They both lived 120. And Moshe also grew up among non-Jews, among Egyptians. And this connects to our Shia before Pesach. You remember Rabbi Akiva said 50 makas. You remember the fifth level. That even the fifth level can go into exile and Rabbi Akiva redeems that level too. That's the Chiddush of Rabbi Akiva. And therefore no darkness eclipses him. He's not afraid of any level of darkness. So Rabbi Akiva says there's a concept of love. Hey, sometimes I have to be busy doing things that seem to be love. It's not what I should be doing. It's not how I should prepare for Shavuos. It's love. Why am I doing this? The answer is, says Rabbi Akiva, if this is the shlichus, 
that Hashem put you on him. Say Hineni. Hein comes from the word Hineni. Hineni. Hein. Yes. I'm here. Hineni means Hineni. I'm here. I'm here. I'm not running away. I'm not disassociating. I'm not even getting upset at you. I'll do it with a smile and then go to my room and say, wow, you're such a sick kid. Because kids know what's happening inside the room. <laughs> it's a real Hineni. It's a real Hein. And the real reason is because the second idea of Akiva looks at situations and he sees you're making a mistake when you think this is light and this is darkness. It's far deeper than anybody imagines. Sometimes you think, here God is not present. For God to be present, it has to look godly, it has to look holy, it has to look sacred. Who ain't a Sorry, Hashem is not here. This is a place of bad, this is a place of darkness. Comes around and says that's a superficial perspective. It make we understand it, we empathize with it, we could feel it, we understand that. But that's the human limited perspective. There's a deeper perspective where Rabbi Akiva says even the deepest love is a form of hain. It's an opportunity to fulfill your mission. And not only that, deep down from this, there's going to be a growth that nobody can ever imagine. You see a fox, Rabbi Akiva says, I'm already laughing now. If you would look at Rabbi Akiva, you would say, Rabbi Akiva doesn't care. Everybody is, imagine the scene, everybody is sobbing, and he's standing there and laughing. Everybody's thought, they're, they're crying, and he's on his phone reading a joke. You ever see that happening? There's a chuppah, <laughs> they're singing, people are crying, and there's a guy on the phone, and he's laughing. <laughs> you don't look at other people during a chuppah, good. There's a bris, the baby is crying, Elio, one of you is there, this guy is texting, he's watching YY clip and crying. I mean laughing. So my clip, Nach is kosher, but there's also other clips. You would think, they're all crying, Rabbi Kiva is laughing. So what do, what, what, what do most people think? He doesn't care. He reminded himself a joke that he heard this morning in Shul. The truth is, it's the opposite. It's not Rabbi Kiva didn't care. Rabbi Kiva was more connected with the reality. They're seeing destruction, and Rabbi Kiva says, there's no ultimate destruction in God's world. There's a nitzutz in everything. There's divinity in everything. It's hidden. It's dark. It doesn't feel good. It's painful. But there's a Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekeinu Hashem Echad even here. And that's Pshad. The Gemara says in Chulun something fascinating. Call the Asr Lachman Lachman Hashanah Lachman Hashanah say Anything that the Torah prohibited, it made something else similar that's permissible. For example, it says no blood, liver yes. And liver tastes like blood. That's why kashering liver is much harder. No marrying your sister-in-law, but there's a leveret marriage where they do marry, do, does marry the sister-in-law. He says, no pig, no chazer, but there's shibuta, there's another type of fish that tastes like a chazer. Especially today, you go to sushi, and they have already mutations of, you ever see these sushi menus? Crab, mit lobster, mit alagot, and I never tasted the originals, but some say it's very good stuff. So now they have imitations of everything. But the Gemara says this, that everything there's an imitation that's permitted. What, what's the point? The point is that everything that's permissible on another level, there's a permissible element there. There's a spark there. It's a very deep idea. So to me, it's forbidden. Like the chaz, it says, La'as, la'as, the chaz is going to be mutter. There's an inner, inner spark. Even now, it's expressed in the fact that something similar is permitted. So Rabbi Akiva says, even what you're looking at, which is a very dark experience, you should just know, even if I may not always be able to feel it or understand it, like Rabbi Akiva felt it and understand it. But you should know that there's a hain in this love. And because there's a hain in this love, it's not the end of the story. So don't just look at the foxes and say, my life is destroyed, our life is destroyed, our family is destroyed, our future is destroyed. In our Kodesh HaKadoshim, there's foxes. That's what there is. That's what the Baal Shem Tov said. Not from the Tzorah you'll be helped. Mimena from the Tzorah itself you'll be helped. And then he said Tzorah is Oisius Tzoyar. The word Tzorah is the same letters like Tzorah which means a window. Tzoyar Tasa Teva. Tzorah means narrow, Tzar, distressed. Like Tzorah is a problem, a challenge. Tzara, from the tzara, the tzara opens up a new window. The plowing of the field makes the field fertile for galula, for redemption. He didn't see two things. So when I'm confronting darkness, whatever it may be, internal, emotional, physical, psychological, my own history, my past, my present, my future, a loved one, or whatever the situation is, each person in their own life, 
My, my, my life is being plowed. My field is being plowed. There's foxes all over the place. I don't like foxes. Some people like foxes. I don't. I have nothing against them as long as they stay away. And why Shualim? Why they see foxes? The Gemara says in Brachas, Rabbi Akiva said this, that foxes are the slyest of animals. You know the story, Papa's Ben Yehuda said, why are you teaching Torah? So he said the famous story, the fish are in the ocean, you remember? And the fox said, come out, let's live in peace. So Rabbi Akiva said, foxes, you're supposed to be the wisest, the shrewdest of animals. Because foxes, you know foxes, they attack their prey without them noticing even the last second. No other animal knows how to do that. Even cheetahs and lionesses, they're great hunters. But at the last moment, the gazelle sees, and they run. Foxes outsmart their prey till the last second. So he says, you're the wise, you're stupid. Even in the ocean, we don't know if we're going to live. Outside of the ocean, Rabbi Akiva said this. So now come together, Rabbi Akiva is the one who sees the foxes. What does it mean the foxes coming out of Kedesh HaKadoshim? This is even a deeper tragedy. Shua represents Chachma, wisdom. What's coming out of the Holy of Holies? Wisdom. If you see a person going out of the holies, and who's going out of the Holy of Holies? A boar. No. But sometimes you see it's the fox leaving the Holy of Holies. In other words, it's the wisest and the brightest and the deepest and the most sensitive. That's who's leaving the Holy of Holies. This is a whole different level of crying. This is a whole different level of pain. So of course they cry. Comes Rebbe Kiva and says, in the depth of this experience, I'm telling you, there's a plowing that shakes up a system but makes it fertile for real growth. And when it becomes fertile for real growth, it's the beginning of a Yeshu Skeinim Muskeinim Berchavis Yerushalayim. So we come back now, the argument of Rabbi Shmuel Rabbi Kiva and Lamer, Al Hain Hain Valav Lavu, Al Hain Hain Valav Hain. Not only is it not about semantics, it's a fundamental debate about the entire approach of a person to Torah, to mitzvahs, to their relationship with life that expresses itself in so many different ways. And ultimately we say, Eilu Ve'elu Divri Alakim Chayim, because Rabbi Shmuel is talking from the human experience where we do see a fox and we weep, where there is pain. A person can't always say, I'm like Rabbi Akiva, everything is one, because as we often say, the way out of pain is sometimes through pain. If I just deny and repress, it's not always healthy. It doesn't mean I'm on the level of Rabbi Akiva. It means, it means I'm just disassociated or disconnected. So Rabbi Shmuel says there is the human experience. Hashem comes down into the human experience. And then Rabbi Akiva teaches us, El Moshe Amar Aleil Hashem, the human being was given the opportunity to ascend and to experience life from the experience of oneness. Have a beautiful week and a good nyamtif, a freilich in shvuas, kabbalas atayra to all of you, besimcha bepnemius. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.